Jeremy White podcast. Tuesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Available wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. Well, we're recording, so what's what's going on? Where do you live, by the way? Are you in California? I am. I'm in Los Angeles. I live in the Valley. I love it out here. <clears throat> and um, I'm in my studio right now. See, this is my studio. I just did a revamp of it oh wow okay so talk me so, talk me through the gear what kind of guitars you got in there well you got some okay well or? here i have a 1953 gold top wow 1963 vox <clears throat> old mos Moserite. i'm not sure i think this is 69 or 70 this is a remake but it is uh, for uh pilo panagrino P Whatever, great precision <laughs> bass. Yeah, it looks like a precision and, um, it's a remake. It, like, well, who's the? Yeah, True Customs redid that, and it's awesome. Nice, but old K bass. Yeah, B fifteen. I mean, I have a yeah. lot of stuff, and then I have my, and then this is my control room. Oh wow! Look at that! All kinds of outboard Ooh. gear, analog, analog. I like it. And then my API. Mm. Love it. Tasty tape machine, my four track right there. Wow. Yeah. So this is where I am all the time. So uh, like you, I'm going to stay in here. It's all very vintage. You're, you're kind of like a nostalgic kind of vintage gear kind of woman. I like it. Yeah, I am. I'm a very vintage. See that board? That is an API 1604. And you know who has the sister to that one? Who? Beck. Um, no way. Beck has it. And um, and these are my my prized possessions. These oh, are my wow. six seventy Fairchilds. Wow! And um, you know, and then I'll have a new thing like this virus. You know, it's actually that that keyboard is actually. And then look, my Moog bass Ooh. pedal down here. Nice classic. You got the Taurus pedals. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. That's good stuff, man. So I, I mean, listen, you, you got the tape machines and everything. Are are you? You got to be running Pro Tools somewhere. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I didn't. Yeah. Here. I didn't see a hey, computer in there. Listen, the tape machine. There it is. Oh yeah. It's okay. It's not on. It's just right. not on. It's tucked away in the there corner. There you go. There it is. <laughs> but um, so you know, to me, tape machine, Pro Tools, uh. You know, eight track task cam. It, it all it is is a it's a recording device. But if you give it good sound, it records good sound. So I think this, you know, yes, is tape. You know, can you hear like different warmths and you know uh, different richness? It embraces you know a low end that mm -hmm. you know Pro Tools doesn't do. But the truth is, if just give it nice rich low end. And Pro Tools will record exactly what you give it. So right. I think that's what people need to understand. It's like, at the end of the day, it's just a tape. It's just a recording device. And you give it a good sound. You give it a good song, too, and a good vocal. And it's just going to give back to you what you gave it. So Right, yeah. If you <laughs> I don't get bent up on vintage. but I, But the outboard gear, guitars, drums, everything vintage on that end it just is better it's just hands down yeah way better yeah there's just something about the construction of those instruments and you know the way they were put together i mean you grabbed like you said what was it a 50 a 59 les paul what is 50, that 53 les paul 53. i mean you grab that compared to something that they put out this year i mean it's night and day and I mean, especially well, because the wood is aged it's it's breathed it's lived life and yes it's been played and you know, you go into Guitar Center and you get a 2021, you know, Les Paul. It's just, it's cheaper. It feels cheaper, you mm -hmm. know, like things were just crafted better. And the fact that, yes, um, with pianos, with amps, like the, the, the older the tubes mm -hmm. on an amp, the better the amp sounds. You change those tubes, I'll get, it all of a sudden sounds brighter. Yeah. You know, you have to wear it in again. You have to, you got to leave the fucking amp on three nights in a row to get it into some kind of warmth. And then guitars, it's like other people played it. There's soul. There's that, you, that is a true thing that there is soul that lives in these guitars. 
No, and it's a, and you you can't really buy that you know burnt in kind of thing unless you're buying a piece no. of gear. Same thing with my amps. It's like you know I didn't even know about having to burn in your tubes or those kinds of things. Like I just turn it mm -hmm. on and and then I was talking to a guitar tech. He's like, oh, did you you know leave it on for a couple of days? You know, let the tubes you know burn in a little. bit. I'm like, what does that even mean? And then right. I did it and it was a completely different sound. I was like, oh my god, this is what I've been missing. Yeah, exactly. So oh. it's like important. Let me turn my lights on. So it's important to me to, you know, and then like when I work with artists, you know, like when I've worked with Christina or anybody, I'm always telling them what what microphones I'm, you know, they're singing through. Mm -hmm. um, I try to tell them, um, you know, oh, this is a great guitar. This little junior is oh, nice. one of my most nice. favorite. And then I have this room here. But I, you know, and then I'll say, you listen, you're, you're singing through, you know, an 87 and, you know, that's what that is. And so like everything is like a little showroom in here. Um, do but it's important. Singers, do certain singers come into your studio and, you know, have a request like, oh, you know, I want, uh, I want an 87 mic or, you know, I want, um, you know, I want a 414 or I want the, the Sony there with a the big capsule or do, do they come in and say, where's the C12? I, I sing on a C12. Um, the only person that has done that was Alicia Keys, and she does sing out of C12. <laughs> yeah. oh. You know, or actually, she actually, uh, sorry, that's scratch. Um, she likes Telefunken. So, oh. um, you know, I think that the 251 is her favorite mic. But, you know, yeah, Christina used to say, I used to sing in this microphone that was really long, mm -hmm. and C12s is what they put those girls on all the time. And yeah. so um, I, uh, you know, introduced her to the U47 because to me, the U47 embraced the the richness of her voice much better. And um, so then she became a U47 girl. Yeah, a lot of people talk about the 47, even like the FET 47. People still use it on kick drums these days. <clears throat> Oh, I, I, I don't use any other microphone besides the FET 47 on the on the kick. Yeah. What's uh? I want to talk about this new song. So the letter obviously is coming from the soundtrack, this big movie. Well, it's it's a Hulu series or kind of thing. So, I mean, it's first song in fifteen years. Was it kind of weird to come back and be Linda Perry again? Um, it's not weird. It's been over fifteen years. Um, but it's like, you know, I scored the film. It's called Kid Ninety. It's on Hulu. It's a documentary. Documentary. Um, and Leonardo it's about, DiCaprio is uh, an executive producer, right? Yes. And he's in it. A little young Leonardo is in there. Like the film is filled with all these young Hollywood stars before they made it. And um, and it's all done on camcorder. That's Soleil Moon Fry, Punky Brewster, um, shot, you know, during this time of growing up. And that's what makes it so compelling. It's like she had this journalistic point of view so early on. And now people would consider it an IG story today. You well, know? That's it. She, <laughs> yeah, she's kind of like the original vlogger yeah, in a way. Exactly. She is. And so she documented, you know, years and I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. And um, and it's a coming of age story. And so I scored the film. And then at the end of the film, she um, finds a letter, a 16 year old Soleil wrote to her older self and in that letter it's expressing like i hope you found love happiness you know friends and so i wrote the song underneath that you know as she's reading the letter and then i turned it into a full song because it was just an underscore and then i turned it into a full song and you know and the lyrical content and the way the song is it needed to be really raw. It needed to be understated. It needed to just support. And emotionally and lyrically, it's very, um, I relate to it. Mm. And um, so, you know, and I, I just used a different voice, you know, because I normally I have a very big, robust, you know, very loud voice. And I just kind of took this very vulnerable more emotional kind of talking narrative, you know, perspective vocally and um, left the course with hmms because to me that emotionally said what I needed it. I, 
I more maybe what I should say, I wanted it to feel. I didn't want people to hear the chorus and go, oh yeah. I wanted them to feel what the chorus was. And I think the ums really did that, you know, and I think it's beautiful. I love the strings and I just it's just two guitars, you know, stereo guitars and strings and vocals, and that's it. Yeah, it's very stripped back, and like you said, it's not this big euphoric rock song. It's 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 really kind of driving home the plot of the whole thing. And so, when you go into write a song like that, I mean, you know, obviously with the letter and everything, do you have to read the letter and try and pull something from that, and then you you go from there and write lyrics to it, or like, how do, what's the songwriting? Yeah, song? I did. Like, I mean, I did. I I well, first of all, I when that scene showed up, I turned off the volume. I didn't want to hear the dialogue. I just wanted to watch her facial expression, watch the editing and and discover what the song wanted to be. And then I found the song, then I turned on the dialogue and it fit perfectly. And then, yes, I listened to what she was saying in the letter and there were key things that I wrote down and tied into the song. And um, to, so it was still personalized for Soleil and her journey, but also that it stood out and could be relatable to people listening. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess you're just really trying to convey emotion at that point. Yes. Hmm. That Honestly, that's all I try to do. You know, Jeremy, my whole writing career and the way I approach is I only approach emotionally. Hmm. I don't know how to, I don't know how to, you know, pick up a guitar and go, okay, I'm going to play A and then I'm going to do a G and then I'm going to do maybe an E minor. Yeah, I'll do an E minor. And yeah. then I'm going to write about, you know, the beautiful lady playing a tambourine. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to do that. I just pick up the guitar or I go to the piano and I just feel my way through. And then when something comes, I ad lib. And then when I record everything um, and I just start ad libbing and just trying to understand where I am emotionally. And that's where the songs come from. They come together, the lyric, the melody and the, the arrangement and um, music all come at the same time. So you're not doing like, you know, the Max Martin melodic math kind of thing or, you know, I, I was interviewing Desmond Child not too long ago. And he was saying that he always comes in with a really catchy title. And the song usually starts with the title, whereas with you, it it all comes together at the same time. It all comes. Yeah, I don't. To me, I just have to. Tr I mean, I know a lot of people have their formats and the way they work. I mean, I know big producers that you know use one template, one twenty seven. Um, mm. They f the format, the pitch, the key, what the lyrical content should be exactly how they line up the vocals to hit right on you know beat yeah. and that's how they have a lot of success and you could take those songs and put them all together and it'll sound like the exact same song over and over um <laughs> sound like a loop I, you know exactly and then um yeah but me not saying my process is my process is my process and it's the only way i know how to write i've never come in with a song title like get the party started for instance that was just me dicking around with some somebody keeps calling me um oh. sorry about that somebody um i i totally forgot to shut off my thingies um you know i just came in and came up with the song was having fun with all this non-organic non-analog you know instrumentation right so is that the first time you because i read somewhere that was the first time you actually got pro tools right no, I didn't have Pro Tools at the time. I had D88s. Oh, geez. Um, um, and I didn't venture into Pro Tools quite yet, but I had these D88s that were like, okay, this is cool. Let me try it out. And then, um, yeah, and then just grabbed a microphone and the words just came out exactly as I'm coming up. You better get this party started. So, you know, I think that um, I, I ha I've written my best songs when I operate you know, from that process when it's organic, it's natural. If I've ever worked with somebody and they wanted to come in with a thought or a lyrical content, I don't do my best. I just don't. Mm. It has to have my best work organically. 
For me, it does. Yeah. It's interesting. I was just playing Get the Party Started last night on the radio. I work on, like, the biggest hot AC radio station in, in Canada. And I was oh. playing Get the Party Started literally last night. It was one of my Way Back Wednesday tracks. And... The, the way back wednesday i know oh. it, it's not old that's what i'm saying but i was i was listening to it again and just you know listening to the drum beat and like the sound of the drums and the guitars that are you know like the wow like what yeah. is that what is that sound that's in that is, is that actually a guitar or was that like programmed no no that's actually a guitar so what happened was you know i i went and bought all this new technology because i wanted to find out what was because i was just hearing a lot of very clean sounding productions, you know, and that, well, the, 90s, that time. The, the late nineties was very much like that. And until Mutt yeah. Lang came around with Shania and said, okay, we're doing big guitars and big drums again. Yeah. Changed everything. So, but exactly. So I was trying to figure out what the hell is that? And somebody said, Oh, those are NPCs. It's a Triton keyboard that has all this stuff in it, you know, a roll in expansion, you know, whatever. And I was like, okay. And so I went and got all these things, hooked it all up and, you know, programmed the beat on the MPC. And, um, so now, those drum you, sounds are like the built in sounds on the MPC. The, well, they're manipulated because, you know, I run them, I run through EQs and I do stuff, right. but, um, yeah. so there's a program you, there at the time that they were discs, uh, or a file card mm. so you load in the sounds and then it's all separated kick snare you, you can have four kicks five kicks five snares hi-hats you know so i just loaded in the sounds that i liked and then i ran that through compressors and eqs and then you just program the beat so the kick and then you do the snare and then and then that just loops you know and then i went and added percussions so after I looped it all down and there's no pro tool. So I had to wait. All right. Three minutes and 40 <laughs> seconds, I guess I'll just go loop it down for, you know, that long. Oh man. You know, I didn't, cause there's no cut and paste for me. Mm. So I'm looping this down and then I get the Triton and I was looking for a bass in there and I just couldn't find a bass. So I just picked up my bass, played the bass again, all the way down. And then, then start finding all the like weird little sounds, the claves, the this. I laid down some percussions, some real percussions. Yeah, there's even um, some, like so horns and like strings, like stuff going in there. That too. that's from the expansion card. So then mm. I went to the Roland expansion card, found these horns, and I'm just doing whatever sounds right. Then I took my Moog and made some sounds on the Moog. So it's a it's a combination of analog and and you know um, samples in these keyboards, and then. The guitar, I couldn't get the sound I wanted, so I just got my wah wah and my guitar, and I just played guitar on it. And then, um, you remember I what think, amp I mean, it was? Did you have like your Vox amp mic with a fifty-seven it, or like? It, it was my Vox amp because at that time it was the only thing I wanted to do. So it was my, it was my uh, fifty-three gold top because that that was my go-to. Nice fifty-three gold top through my wah wah, um, regular standard crybaby, um, through my Vox. Um, and I just put a 57 through 1176 and, um, and I had an eight, um, uh, uh, Neve 1073, uh, preamp and, um, it went into that and that was my chain. Then I put some reverb on it. Um, I had my sense cause I had my, uh, my H, uh, 5,000. Um, and then, um, no, actually I had my, um, my, uh, yeah, I don't. It was a and the, and the quadriverb. Oh my god, I gotta find my quadriverb. Like like that was the cheapest reverb, but it was the best reverb. <laughs> and um, so that's what it was. So the quadriverb, and then and then I just laid all that down, you know, one by one for three and a half, four minutes, whatever. And then and then I just went with the vocal, and I just grabbed the bullet microphone. You know, that's a that's a harmonica microphone. Right. Because that was that's what was sitting there, and I wanted, and I kind of sang you know, weird, you know, I'm coming up, you know, and then I, then I did like, it. And I was like, you weren't like sitting there just going like, wow, 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 wow. Like it, you actually had words as you were going with it. Yeah, no, I just, 
I just made wow. up words on the spot. And then I did that one take all the way through. And then I went back and wrote down everything. I was making it up. I wrote down everything I said, and then I filled in the blanks and then crafted it into something more. But 80% of the lyric just showed up and all the hooky lines that just showed up on the fly. And all I knew was when I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to say every cliche thing I can think of, you know, and then it was just like, you know, I have no idea. And then, um, then I mixed that and then I met pink a week later and I was like, holy shit, I got this weird, crazy. It's a hit, you know, mm. song. I played it to her and then she played it to LA Reed. And then they basically said, we have our first single, you know, and then that's how my journey started basically in songwriting and collaborating and producing. I just went right into it. Right. <laughs> and that's the best way to ever do it. Cause it's like, holy shit, you know, <laughs> look at this. Yeah. You know, did, did you ever, did you pitch that song to anybody else or was like pink the first one that, you know, a hook line and sinker you got her. Well, the, the second day I, on the second day I wrote it, I did, I pitched it to um, Madonna. Um, I wow. sent it to guy. I sent it to guy Oseri. And, um, and, uh, you know, I was like, I, you know, and, and we knew each other and I said, I think this song is a hit, you know, maybe Madonna. And then he came back like a couple of days later and just said, no, not, not for her. And then, um, and then I was, then pink showed up and then I played it to her and that was more organically. It wasn't even, it was just like, Oh, I wrote this crazy song. Cause she was like, do you have any songs or anything? I'm like, actually I do have this weird song that would actually probably be fitting for you. And not even really expecting her to come back with, Oh my God, I love this song. Cause I just hmm. gave her uh, a CD of it, you know? And, and that was it. Wow. And who would have thought like, that would be like the launching pad in a way, you know? Yeah. Did Madonna ever like cut a demo vocal or is there like a like a Madonna no, no. of her doing that anywhere? No, or? no, no. They 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 simply passed on the song. Wow. That was dumb. <laughs> it's Madonna. She doesn't need those kind of things. And, yeah, she, and you she know, was doing yeah. a bunch of cool stuff. You know, she had like Ray of Light around that time. And... Oh, yeah. No, that album was such a great album. In fact, thanks for reminding me of that. I'm doing something on a about my top albums and that definitely like that was a sneaker because um you know i listened to ray like the very first time and i was like Ugh. yeah it's, you know it didn't it did, i didn't get it like i was actually very disappointed but then oh. i listened to it again and then i listened to it again and the more i listened to it the more brilliant the, the that album became it's like it's actually a really brilliant record yeah you know I, that she did it's very artsy too yeah yeah. And that was her discovery of going into this definitely more artistic, you know, place, you know, and I wish she would come back a little bit and get back to that area because, yeah. you know, but um, anyways, but yeah, so that's how that all started. And then just it all kind of started moving that way. That's awesome. Oh, that's such a cool story. I, I, I learned so much today. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, obviously, what's up? Hit a billion views online, which is pretty nuts. Do you ever think that would happen? I mean, a, a, that's that's a lot of views. Yeah. I mean, no. I mean, you don't know. Like, it's like every. It's so weird the business right now because everything is so in your face, but not. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was talking about. Like, it's so weird how, you know, you can look on someone's Instagram and see that you know somebody has. 500 million followers yeah. really do they have 500 million followers um you know and but then you don't really know how they're doing musically mm -hmm. you don't really know how many albums they're really selling like is a very numbers are very it's a very delusion it's like a magic trick right now it's all you know it's all this like it's all theater grand, of the mind it is and um but, you know, in when I was, you know, in a BAM and, you know, before Instagram and and, you know, the Internet showed up, you know, you'd watch your success on Heat Seekers and Billboard. Yeah. And you'd watch your success on MTV. If you were being played on MTV, you were a hit. That was it. Mm. Nobody. If you weren't a hit, you weren't on MTV. 
But if you were on MTV and the more you were on it, the bigger of a hit you were. If you were on Heat Seekers and then jumped on the billboard, you were hit. So I, I guess all I'm just trying to say is, yes, one billion, woohoo. You know, but that doesn't transfer in dollars to me. No. You know, at all. That's all free. And um, and it is quite an illusion because one might think, oh, a billion, uh, you know, views. Oh, God, Linda Berry is doing amazing. You know, if somebody streams two million streams, they have two million streams. That's nothing. Like, it's not two yeah. million dollars. No, no. Or even close to that. It's like more like maybe 20 grand. You know, it's like, but then you don't really know how someone's doing in success wise. It's very strange to me. It's like everything's a brand. Everything's a name. Everything's a number. Yeah. You know, but it's, I don't know. What does it all mean? What does yeah. a 1 billion views mean? 1 billion people watched it, you know, but was it 1 billion or was it, 500 million and a lot of people um, um, watched it a few times Multiple. or is it, you know, 200 million, you know, like 1 billion is a lot. Trust me. I know not many songs are going to hit that. And mine did. And I'm very, very grateful. And yes, I wrote an awesome song, you know, and I'm so proud of that, you know, but I don't get hung up on numbers is in a long roundabout. I went around the corral rode my horse around like five, 10 times to get to this point. Numbers don't mean anything to me. Yeah. And it's interesting. You said, you know, okay. Billion views. whoop de doo I mean, it's, it is a big thing, but you said, you know, it, it doesn't really translate into a monetary kind of thing. It's like, you know, even upcoming artists, it's like, how do how do they get paid now? Yeah. You know, it's very difficult breaking new, you know, I'm a manager too. I, I have a, an artist named Willa Mai, and she's on the Hulu soundtrack and in the movie. Um, she has a song coming out Friday, actually, called Not a Soldier. Hmm. And she's 16. She is phenomenal, amazing. But it's fucking hard. It is very hard to break a new artist, you know, coming from nowhere, you know. And, and that's why labels don't sign new artists. They sign TikTok artists right now. They sign influencers because those people have the numbers and yeah. they can have an instant fan base that the label doesn't have to put all this mindset into developing an artist. Developing an artist is like a fucking race marathon that doesn't end. Like you're yeah. constantly running and running and it's like you're getting tired and you have to conjure up a little bit of more momentum to keep you going. It's fucking hard, you know? So Anyways, you know, I think that, it, you know, yeah, how do you know, how do you, we know artists are breaking? I'm not even sure anymore. I, you know, I can't base it off of Instagram and, you know, but I guess when a TikTok uh, influencer is singing it, that means something, yeah. I guess, or doing something, but, you know, doing it's, some it's TikTok very weird. Dance, you know? Yeah, it's very strange. It's a very weird time right now. Yeah, even on the radio, it's like, you know, we're playing so many TikTok songs. and I'm, But it's like a flash in the pan. Okay, next week it's gone. Whereas, you know, what's up? Look, a billion views. How many years later? And it's still a massive yeah. thing. So well, that's, what, that's what I'm going to follow. That never gets old for me. I'm always going to follow my, my format. I'm always going to do what I do. And, you know, if a song gets on the radio or becomes a hit, that's a secondary thing. That's a bonus. That's awesome. You know, but I can't come from that perspective. I never did before. So I, I can't start now. And when I have, you know, like tried to write a hit for somebody that came to me and said they want to hit flop, 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 flop. I mean, I have a lot of flops, you know, from trying. Yeah. So I can't do that anymore. That's why scoring right now really works for me because it's all emotional. Yeah. What's the, well, so how do you make that transition to go from writing a song like at the party started to scoring? Like, you know, did, who who are your like scoring influences? You, you you watch Star Wars and hear John Williams like, oh, that's such a great score piece. Or how do you how do you go about doing that? 
I just, you know, I've always written from that point of view, like everything that I write, there is a visual because I can close my eyes and just feel my way through the songs. Um, and I've always, I've just always really appreciated soundtracks and scores. Like I'd always listen past the actor, you know, right. and just listen to what was supporting. I don't know why I just did instinctively it was something very natural. I knew I would be here. You know, this was going to be another chapter. I'm entering another chapter of my career. Um, and this is just exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm going to be very successful in it. Watch, you know, because it organically feels right for me. And the transition is super easy because now I just watch somebody. I listen to what's going on. I can feel my way through. And then I create a bed of music that is a support not something that stands in the way, not something that gets lost, but something that feels like a low, a low rumble of a bass. Mm. You know, it's not in your face. It's not out there, but you feel it. It's like right. that low end. That's what I want to create. And I did um, Soleil's show um, movie. And then I also just scored this other documentary that I'll be letting everybody know about soon. And then I'm branching into all these other projects that are film and TV um, that are all music um, driven. So I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be right now. Yeah. And you just you seem like you're having an absolute blast doing it, too. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, I come to my studio every day. You're a guitar player, you said? Yeah, I pretty much play everything. Yeah. Um, but you know how fun that fucking is. I yeah, mean, yeah, I, I, I leave my house. I walk to my studio most of the time because it's like three miles away. Nice. I come in here and I get to play music all day. And then on scoring, the fun part about that, I don't need anybody. Like I'm in here all by myself and I get to do exactly what I want to do. And then I give it to the director. The director gives their input. And then I got it's a beautiful relationship. And then I get to just experiment on top of that, you know, as much as people think they're left field and they're doing all these really experimental things, they're not, you mm -hmm. know, <clears throat> I was just talking to like a metal um, show and, you know, I'm disappointed in metal. Like what happened to the good fucking metal bands? Like yeah. that shit fucking, you know, talking it's about shredding and ripping your face off like that. But there were still good songs. Mm -hmm. There were still good songs behind the music. And that's it. where the fuck is the great rock band? Where is this? You know, there's good bands out there. I'm not going to say that. Yeah. And, but I'm just missing those iconic, you know, fucking rock songs that why, you know, Jane says or or or, you know, Jamie's crying or, right. you know, fucking love drive by Scorpions or, you know. Dr. Feelgood, like there's like these rock songs and and smells like teen spirit and Jeremy and, you know, fucking black hole sun. It's like know, there's... guitar riffs, you know, like yeah, nobody's just... doing guitar riffs anymore. When are we yeah, going to get so... another photograph? <laughs> you know? Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, the, fucking Def Leppard wrote so many great fucking rock songs. Bon Jovi. I mean, so many. I mean, and and um, so I'm kind of missing that feeling of like you know that stadium rock right now yeah so i'm hoping that's going to show up and but you know what it comes down to is you know when when bands like that's why i love neil young mm. love neil young because neil young doesn't change for fucking time at all he stays <laughs> neil young all the way through but then you have like certain iconic bands that are trying to shift through time yeah. it's like no, no, don't eh, go back. Yeah, but don't you, you think that's better. also a part of, you know, kind of um, uh, developing as a as an artist, you know, or um, uh, what's the word? No because, for? no, because it sounds try hardy. You can tell mm. you can tell you can tell when you hear it, when an artist, you know, that had such a big legacy is trying yeah. to be relevant. Well, look at Bon Jovi and his basic, you know, his wedding band at this point. Yeah. <laughs> God, he put on an album last year and it was terrible. And yeah. I, I'm a big Bon Jovi fan. I was like, dude, like get Richie back in the band and start playing rock songs again. Enough That's what I'm saying. It's like, you know, like 
when when the whole kind of mindless pop started showing up in the mid you know 2000s you know you know 2010 all that stuff yeah i kind of you know um i just when people didn't want deep i wasn't going to change i'm deep i just go deep it's just my it's just where i go i like writing beautiful songs yeah i just do you know uh, get the party started is a random occasion for me, you know, um, but I go deep. I love that, you know, and you can look at a song so, like, uh, you know, Christine Aguilera, beautiful. It's like that yeah. that's a fucking deep song. Yeah. But when I when people don't want deep, I just go find something else to do. But I'm not going to shift and change out of that's my wheelhouse. I don't know how to write a song for. Katy Perry. I just don't. I don't know how to write those kind of songs that are very formula, that has their takeoff, their low point, the takeoff, the, you know, I yeah. just, I'm just not, that's just not my thing. So I just, I always have to wait until it comes back. Everybody always wants deep. Everybody always wants raw. Everybody always wants emotion. It just comes in waves. So you just got to wait for the next wave and, and keep yourself busy until then. Even that was profoundly deep. Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> well, I blame I blame rich kids and their parents are buying the MacBook Pros and the uh, <laughs> ruining pop. <laughs> Anyways, well, Linda Perry, brand new song. The letters available now as part of the um, Soleil Moon Fry documentary on Hulu. Kid ninety, go pick it up, and you're doing the score for it and everything. So it's a whole Linda Perry project. Yeah, great. So the score is coming out soon, and um, yeah, and then you know. Uh, Check out my kid, um, Willa Amai. It's A-M-A-I, and her song, Not a Soldier, is coming out on Friday. So, um, you know, so thanks for that support, give, um, giving me the platform to say that, because like I said, yeah. it's super fucking hard to, to um, break artists right now. I'm going to check that out. What kind of music is it? Is it like... Uh... She's like indie pop. Okay. She's great. She's 16. Um you know, Brad, do you want to send it to, we'll send it to you. We'll send you the video and yeah. the song. I'd love to get um, it. She's great. Like she's got this very, people just love her. She's, she's, she's got a dark undertone. Yeah. And, um, but she's as square as they come, mm. you know? And when you see this kid, she's 16. She looks like she's just got out of college, nice. but she, um, beautiful voice. Lyrics are incredible. And um, she is, this song is very, very important, I believe. And you'll like it. I, I believe you'll like it. But it's like dark indie pop. Yeah. No, I'm stoked to check that out. That's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm all in for it. Sweet. She's very singer-songwriter, too. Cool. So check it all out. All right. Well, Linda, it's great to meet you. This is awesome today. Thanks so much. Thank for you. I all appreciate right. it. All right. Uh, anything else? I mean, you've, weekend. Said, you've said it all. So I guess that's it. I did it all. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Thanks. Jeremy. Yep. Bye. See you later.